of the Reformation. He's what you would call a man born ahead of his time. The ideas that this man wrote about and preached were the ideas that were the fuel for the Reformation. But the Reformation didn't happen during his life. But he, he saw his trained clergymen so he could read Latin. And he knew what the Bible said. And he looked at what the church was doing. He says, the church and the Bible do not agree with each other in these ways. And they need to change. Now to say such a thing, Wycliffe was risking getting burned at the stake. And, and being stripped and declared a heretic and thrown out of the church. But he did it anyways. So this is very, you know, really courageous. I mean, you risk your life to say those kinds of things. Everyone, look at some of the things Wycliffe did and said. And we're talking about an Englishman here. A little bit, let's get some dates involved here. And then we're going to see, after Wycliffe's death, his teaching and ideas getting into other countries and having a profound effect. So, let's see. His date of his birth, 13... About, they're not sure, about 1324. We're talking 200 years before the Reformation. Born in York, Yorkshire, England. Uh, and he really was a tremendously well-educated man. You see all the degrees he, he received here. Uh, let's see. He's called a... Uh, and you don't have to write all these down, but just to get an idea, this man was, was a tremendously well-educated, was a brilliant scholar. Fellow of Merton College in about 1360, master of Baylor College. Uh, by the time, this, by this time, he had a reputation as an outstanding theologian and philosopher at the university, principal speaker in theological debates. And in 1361, he's the vicar of the parish of Fillingham, and later the rector of Lutonworth. Now, I don't, you know, I don't worry about what all the the uh, titles mean now. But he's a well-educated man. He's part of the church. And I want you to see what, where his ideas were the fuel for the Reformation. Wycliffe regarded the Bible as a living and authoritative book. He saw and commented on the many discrepancies between the standards set by scriptures and the practices of the church. And we just did that. We looked at one Bible verse and we said, how is the church standing up here? And how is it failing? And that's what he did. And he says, if the church does not agree with the book, it needs to change. And he was vocal, and he would write, and he would preach. If you will, maybe uh, in his benefit, he ended up having a stroke and died before they could burn him at the stake. Because 42 years after he was dead, either 42 or 40. Four years later, the church authorized to dig his bones up, burn them, and throw them in the river. I mean, they, they hated this man so much. Imagine 44 years, I've got to dig your body up because they dislike you. <laughs> All right? So, uh, let's see. So, he declared the Bible to be the highest authority for every Christian and the standard of faith in human perfection. Noting that the Bible said the gospel was to be given freely, Wycliffe attacked the money-grabbing and impoverishing practices of the medieval church. He criticized such unscriptural practices as prayer to saints. Which is good to find it in the scriptures. Shouldn't be there. Pilgrimages. Stuff in your Bible about says and going on a pilgrimage. A mission trip. But a pilgrimage, no, but that's not what we're about. We're about missions. And selling of indulgences, and anybody here not know what that is? Okay. okay. Meaning, you have sinned and you want to be forgiven, you pay a certain amount, you get, an, you get a written statement that your sin has been forgiven. So you actually pay with cash to have your sins forgiven. And popes and, and bishops and different church were when they were low on money, they would send out people selling indulgences. And he spoke up against it. He also condemned confessions. He did not believe in the confessional. He believed that God forgave sin. You did not need to confess your sins to a priest. He preached against it. He preached against images, and he preached against celibacy. Priests should not have to be celibate. If he wants to, that's fine, but he should not have to. He, 
And he said, that's a long list of things he went after. Look at that list. And we have uh, prayer to saints instead of to God, pilgrimages, and, you know, uh, I don't know, they thought that if you went on a pilgrimage, it made you more holy somehow. They weren't all to the Holy Land. They have different pilgrimages to different places they were supposed to go on. Selling of indulgences, condemned confessions, images, and celibacy. Decrying the feudal power of the church. He didn't think the church would have political power. It wasn't the church's mission, and it did. He held that each person was directly responsible to God. Now, this creates tensions, obviously. Uh, in his benefit, the English king, King Edward III, you know, kings resented the power of the Pope. And particularly since, uh, if you will, the, the, the Catholic Church had more money than they did, and more power than they did. So there was some resentment. So, and to some degree, some of the rulers liked the reformers, or those who would speak out against the church, because they had their own gripes with the church. So, uh, it's interesting how this works out here. 1374, Wycliffe was appointed to a royal commission created to resolve a number of issues that had arisen. Many of the bishops on the commission accepted bribes of lucrative jobs. So you're on a commission to resolve something, and somebody is bribing different people on the commission. By the way, do we do that in politics today? We have a problem, so we create a commission. So people bribe the commissioners. Well, you know, some things don't change. And so the commission that was supposed to solve the problem becomes the what? The problem. The problem. Yes. Oh, corrupt commission to solve a corrupt problem. And what we end up is a bigger tax bill. The, the lesson is, next time a, a politician says, we're going to solve someone because we're going we're to appoint a commission to take care of it, you say, uh, you pay them. <laughs> oh. And once you have a commission and you have all these positions that you can give to your who? Your friends, your family, whoever puts up the... Remember nepotism? Yes. Yeah, commissions are great for nepotism. It, it hasn't changed. Matter of fact, the state of New York is particularly bad on this area. <laughs> oh, all right. Our politicians first they go first they you know they go to Albany, then they go to jail. But anyways, it's a cycle. <laughs> I, I'm kidding, but I'm not kidding. If you follow New York State politics, yes. All right. So. Uh, Look what he writes. This is, this is, these are fighting words. 1376, Wycliffe wrote in a document called On Civil Dominion, he wrote, England belongs to no Pope. Whoa! <laughs> uh, he's trying to get Innocent III to turn over in his grave. Okay? Alright? Whoa! Th those are, those are bold words for a man to say in that age. He is, he is putting his neck on the line. And he says, the Pope is but a man, subject to sin. But Christ is the Lord of Lords, and this kingdom is held directly and solely by Christ alone. Whoa! Now, I, I, we see fighting words. This guy is, is extremely bold. He's not beating around the bush here. Now, as a great theologian and a, a teacher in different colleges and universities, his students were listening to this stuff. And he had some of them fired up. Wycliffe was actually a very popular man among many. But no one else, you know, very few of the rulers would stand in his corner. Even though they might like what he's saying, they were scared to do so. Okay, not everybody, not everybody wants to be burned at the stake for opening their mouth. If you will. So, <laughs> The treatise resulted in being called to answer charges before a group of bishops at St. Paul's Cathedral. <laughs> he arrived in the company of two very powerful supporters. Look at who he has people on his side. The Marshal of England, Lord Piercy, and John Gaunt. He's, he's, a, he's, he's, he's the son or grandson of Edward III. 
He, uh, actually, he was acting as king when Edward was sick. So, when Percy presumed to tell Wycliffe he could be seated rather than stand during the proceedings, the bishops were so enraged that a riot broke out. Could you imagine this? They're supposed to have a hearing to see if this bit. They let him sit down, and people come to blows. They couldn't do anything because the thing ended in a riot. Can you imagine that? Sitting down and someone sitting in a courtroom and a, and a fight breaks out and you got to have to stop the whole proceedings. So, though Wycliffe has never burned at the stake, he's never tortured, you can get an idea of the hatred towards this man for saying things that we hold dear today. Okay? But it lets you know. I mean, it, you know, that's, that's, what, that's what the historians say. Make a good movie, eh? You got a good fight scene all built in there, you know? All right. <laughs> It's a true one. So, in 1378, shortly after the death of Edward I, Wycliffe wrote on the truth of the Holy Scripture, in which he stated his view that the Bible is without error and constitutes the ultimate authority in matters of doctrine. Now, I think I've done this with you before, but this is... This is not how... Roman Catholicism works. Do you remember the three pillars of Roman Catholicism? Some of you probably have that in your your confirmation classes. The three pillars of Catholicism. Anybody? All right. We won't excommunicate you. Don't worry. All right. Uh, your three pillars. This is how Roman Catholicism is set up, was then, and is today. One is the scriptures, or Bible. That's one pillar. The second one is tradition. And the third one is what we call a papal... Do we do it like that? Papal bull. Which is an edict or pronouncement from the Pope. Those are the three pillars. They are considered equal. And that's the basis of the medieval church. It is still the basis of the Catholic Church today. And Wycliffe is saying, no, no, cut out the tradition, forget the papal bull, Bible only. And that was the call of the reformers 200 years later. They said, scriptures only. And this was this is how this is how Wycliffe stood. So his ideas are revolutionary. They are way ahead of his time, and he is bold, and he is well-educated, and he's well-spoken, and obviously the fury of the church is there, but some of the English rulers were not too happy with the church anyways. And they said, Bible only, we don't have to listen to the Pope, maybe that sounds like a good idea. They didn't like the Pope's civil authority over them. They were resentful of it. So this is one of the reasons why he never ended up dead before he died of natural causes. So, I'm not going to go through all of this, but let's see. This is what got him in big, big trouble here. He had some public officials who sided with him, and some church leaders who sided with him until he did this. Three years later, Wycliffe rejected the church's teaching on transubstantiation. Whoa! When he did that, okay, he lost many supporters. And as you understand, Catholicism, even today, especially in, in the Middle Ages, ages, what is the most important part of that religion? The miracle of the Mass. They tell you you are eating Jesus' body and you are drinking his blood. Grace comes to a Catholic through communion. What we teach is grace comes through faith. Faith in what? God's Word. That's how you receive grace. You hear and believe, and thus you get entered to God's abundant favor. They're teaching knowledge through the miracle of the Mass. And of course, you know, that's. <coughs> so there's two opposing views going on here. When he said that, he lost a lot of support because that was the heart and soul of medieval Catholicism. In many ways, it's still the heart and soul of Catholicism. All right. Now, 
there, you know, we'll talk a more, you know, because obviously, and, and the other thing to remember with these reformers, many of their ideas later on the Catholic Church will accept. Is your Bible in English today in the Catholic Church? Yes. Yes. Do they preach in English? Yes. Was that an idea from the Catholic Church? No. No, it came from the Reformers. It came from the Wycliffs and the Husses and the Tyndales, uh, who re Reformers. So they adapted many of the Reformers' ideas. And the Catholic Church actually gives credit and thanks to people like Luther for making them bring the Bible back into the church. Yeah. So, uh, interesting here. We're going to show you how bad this thing gets here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's see. They had a peasant revolt. Blind blame Wycliffe for it. The following year, a council of theologians decreed that his writings contain heresy in Parliament. Now the government gets involved. Issues a bill condemning his teachings. The, 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 the turning point there was when he opened his mouth about transubstantiation, which really got at the heart and soul of, 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 the, of the medieval Catholic Church. Now, they're not sure why, maybe it's people's prayers, grace of God here, perhaps because of his tremendous popularity, Wycliffe was not punished but allowed to retire to the rectory in Lutonworth. He, in one place says he was under house arrest there. He didn't mind at all. What he was busy doing is translating a Bible into what, folks? English. English. And he actually had other people helping him. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about this here. He, he now spurned Latin, however, as the language used to hold people in bondage and began to write only in English. He believed that the common man should be able to read the scriptures in his own language. Now, who actually penned what we call Wycliffe's Bible? We don't know, but it was probably some of his followers. Uh, they mentioned some, Nicola Hereford or John Purvey are the most likely candidates. The translation was made from Jerome's Latin Vulgate, meaning they did not know Greek and Hebrew. So they took Jerome's Bible, which was taken from the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin, and translated into modern English. So it's a translation of a translation. It's not the best, but it's understandable. The people he wanted people to read. What he didn't have is the Gutenberg's press. Remember? 15, oh, 14, is it 1450? 1450. Gutenberg prints 200 Bibles. This is before his time. So Wycliffe could, could work with some men, they could make translations, but they had to handwrite these copies and try to circulate them. Gutenberg's press comes along, and you can start printing mass Bibles. So he, you know, the printing press was part of the fuel for the Reformation to succeed. Get Bibles in thousands of people's hands fast to create a movement. He couldn't do that. So he dies from a stroke in 1384, uh, persecution of his followers continued. Now, look what they did here. 1410, a new law ordered that heretics be burned at the stake, okay, and shortly after Archbishop, Archbishop Arundel declared that it was illegal even to read the English Bible. You think about that a minute. Illegal to read a Bible in your own language. Well, uh, and this is where you have to, you know, at this point, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, is doing the devil's work. They're making it illegal to read a Bible in your own language when it says faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing. Of course, you have to understand what you hear so you can believe it. And they're making it illegal to have a Bible in your own language in England. And yes, to get Bibles to Englishmen, they were first smuggled in from the mainland. We'll see that happen. Bible smugglers, they put them in, and they sold like hotcakes. Even though you could, buy, could put to death for possessing one, people smuggled them in, and they sold as fast as they could get them in. In some cases, the church got bought up illegal copies, so they were out of, to, so the people couldn't read them. Well, that just gave them more money to print some more. 
you know, it, it is, there's a hunger in people for truth. And there's, and there's also powers always trying to suppress it. That will not change. So it's illegal to own a Bible. As a, as a reaction to Wycliffe's writings, that's how they responded to it. Burned at the stake for reading a Bible in the English language. Okay. And, and here it is. Anyone who defied these orders would be burned at the stake as a supporter of heresy. <laughs> So his, his teachings were declared or perceived as a threat to the Roman church. And they were. Absolutely, as it was being practiced. So, let's see. He's condemned a second time long after he's dead, 1415. And then, uh, let's see. What's the date here when they, they burned his bones? 44 years after his death, 1428. They dig up his body, burn his bones, throw the ashes over the river Swift. If you will, they could get rid of his ashes, but they couldn't get rid of his teaching. Okay. Now, I think we'll take the break here. That's kind of a lot. But if you will, this brings out the worst of the worst of the medieval Roman Catholic Church. Now you can be burned at the stake for reading a Bible in your own language. It's really... Pretty gruesome. And the Catholic Church has owned up to the fact that that was a terrible mistake. And, and, have, and, have, and have publicly realized that they were right. But of course in the Church, not until the, the Second Vatican, about 1965, was the first Mass ever given in English. But they thanked the Reformers for some of the Catholic Reforms. Some of them. They're not changing on some other issues. Don't try to get the Pope to change his view on uh, uh, transubstantiation. <laughs> or these three pillars of the Catholic Church. Don't expect them to change tomorrow either. All right? <laughs> By the way, Pastor Moore uses on his father, who converted to Catholicism, he says, Dad, he says, you know, I remember in confirmation class, one of the pillars was the Bible. Dad, you don't have a Bible. Dad, you should read the Bible. It's one of the pillars of your church. His father said, oh, yeah, I think I should do that. <laughs> he started a reformation in Ernie's heart. Yeah, yeah. Started reading the Bible on his own. Yeah. And by the way, that's, this is one of the ways you help to reach your Catholic friends. Okay? Who may or may not be saved. Did you know Catholics? Yeah. yeah. Okay? You can't, just because they are, you can't decide either way. You have to ask about their personal faith. Mark was with me when we were in the Canica, when we visited a very devout Catholic woman. And, you know, she had her kids' pictures and pictures of Mary and Joseph next to them, you know. I mean, you know, this is, you know, Catholico. You know what I'm talking about. And we mentioned something about a Billy Graham crusade. She said, oh, I used to love to watch Billy Graham on TV. So I said to her, you know, at the end of the Billy Graham crusade, they always have a prayer that you're supposed to pray. Do you ever pray that prayer? Said, oh, I always do, every time I watch. Oh. <laughs> well, what is that prayer? Jesus saved me a sinner. <laughs> and and well, we listened to this, she had a real measure of truth. Of course she believed the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. She listened to Billy Graham preach and believed what he was saying and said the prayer. Oh, we got a sister. She just doesn't know it. <laughs> but we didn't know it. So you're going to meet Catholics who have real faith in Jesus, his death and resurrection, and may have salvation, not know it, or maybe that far from it. Okay? Anyways, it's a... Don't know it. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, was, that was a wonderful experience for us and for her. And she did admit to us that when her son was a teenager, he went to he went to a um, a, a Protestant church like ours that was in Me Mechanicville, and it did him a lot of good. Yeah, you know, she could I mean, she she could see the hand of God in different places outside of Catholicism. All right, all right. Take a break, and we'll look at our next reformer.